introduce Penelise. Penelise, uh, she's going to be speaking later, but since she's here now, we might as well get some questions going. Yeah, so um, I'll maybe, well, I'll, I'll introduce myself, um, but then just so you know who I am and why I'm asking you these questions, but um, and then I want to do it later. Uh, my name is Penelope Strohs. I am, I, uh, why, why am I speaking at an indigenous adaptation uh, session? Well, my, my mother is Anishinaabe. Um, I'm uh, native, she's Anishinaabe actually from um, the border of Ontario and Canada, Ontario, Canada, and Michigan, uh, Sault Ste. Marie, Michigan area. It's uh, a gigantic tribe. Uh, we have people in Quebec, and Ontario, Manitoba, Michigan, Wisconsin, Minnesota, all the way over to Montana. Uh, my father was an anthropology professor here at Iowa State University, and I was raised here. Um, I um, was definitely brought up, like I was saying to somebody else before, with a sense that I was responsible for continuing my tribe's stories, traditions, um, even though I wasn't raised there. So I was definitely raised with a very heavy backpack um, <laughs> of responsibility to that um, and I forward in my life in a lot of ways. Um, I'm also the executive director of an organization called the Sustainable Nation. We do training, project development, consulting in indigenous communities. We don't believe in borders, right? So in indigenous communities, in renewable energy, natural green buildings, biologically based wastewater treatment, which probably most of you here know what that means. Uh, a lot of places I go there, like, what? Biologic what? Um, so constructed wetlands, composting toilets, all this and that. Um, and, uh, and food sovereignty. So we work in food sovereignty as well, although that takes a little back. Um, Back burner because there are a lot of organizations in the Native community that work on food sovereignty. So yeah, we stick that in our little toolkit for just in case somebody needs it. Um, these days, it's really exciting because we are no longer a grassroots fringe. So people in the um, Native community, when I was a kid, who were talking about these things, um, I don't know if I want this recorded, but we were like the. Like, <laughs> And um, uh, people didn't quite know what to do with a lot of these different techniques and technologies and integrated with culture and tradition. What, what does that even look like? We started Sustainable Nations when I was 23 because basically we wanted to start an organization where people could get training, could get knowledge, like I'm talking professional level training, knowledge about how to do these things from within a cultural context. So the foundation for everything is spirituality. The foundation for everything is your culture and your traditions and your responsibility to your homeland and your community. Um, from that emerges all of these other things. Um, so are we, when we do trainings, we do them. Um, we're culturally hosted. We have native instructors because honestly, we try to bring in a lot of youth. And you know, I'm I'm mixed, so I get I'm just kind of comfortable with a lot of different things. But um, uh, a lot of people aren't. A lot of people have, do not have the privileges and the comfort that I have. I went to Solar Energy International and got my solar electric train. I you know I had access to college. I had access to all these things. A lot of native trains are very very isolated, very remote. They are not comfortable in their And obviously, a lot of our teenagers don't want to be your teenager and you find out what happened to your people, you get angry and you don't want to hear shit from somebody who doesn't even because they're part of your community. So we designed sustainable nations to provide knowledge, training to all kinds of people, whatever they're coming from the base of culture. Um, are, you, are you ready? Not ready, not, not quite yet. Okay, good. Because what I wanted to ask, um, so I'm going to be talking about a lot of different things. Um, right now, I live in Tucson, Arizona. So I run Sustainable Nations. I um, I also am a doctoral student at the University of Arizona. Um, they have a program in their American Indian Studies program. They're wanting to develop a new concentration in sustainability and natural resources. So going down there, working with who who was in the resilience workshop? I see some faces from the resilience workshop. Yeah. So 
Brazilian science, ecological engineering, not a background in engineering from Humboldt. Um, ecological engineering, Brazilian science, and traditional culture is basically what I'm working with down there. But sustainable teaching is my passion. So what I wanted to know from folks here is um, indigenous adaptation. Everybody picked this workshop for a reason. Um, we don't have time to go around, but I just, does anybody want to offer, why, why are you interested in uh, indigenous right back adaptation? Okay. Yes. I'm interested in it because I think indigenous people um, know, seem to know more about the natural environment than anybody else does. Gain that knowledge locally. Who the heck are indigenous people? That's what I'm, I, my earlier question was. Native American is kind of an ambiguous term. If you take it literally, it means anybody that's born here. So. Uh, I want to get, yeah, but. Okay, okay. follow up. Yeah. I mean, adaptation and resilience is kind of, it's either that or bust, right? <laughs> so if you're going to be, if you're going to be a resident, or we say a, a, someone who lives on planet Earth, you have to be resilient, you have to be dynamic, you have to adapt, and that's how you maintain your indigenosity, right? Wherever you are, your homeland or somewhere else, to be, I mean, it's not about being from here or not being from here, it's about being indigenous in the sense that you're able to live where you are in a way that is connect, right? So if people have a sense of their indigenousity, wherever it is, then they've got a lot to teach us about how we can become dynamic again. Because they've had, I mean, you know, nobody's living where they were, the way they were anymore. I mean, the way they were, you know, I mean. Old school. Yeah, <laughs> there ain't no more old school. I think that, uh, and I was speaking before with some of them about Frank Clay, I think that if you, if you look at uh, Native peoples, both in Canada and the United States, you have people that were just really pushed to the brink um, of extinction and, and, and where the government action, not just individuals action, but actual government policy, um, destroyed families over generations to the boarding school system. Uh, through forced movement of peoples off of their ancestral lands and to reservations, um, and, and, and forcing people off the reservations into the cities to try to, you know, forcibly integrate them, and and you have this, um, you know, throughout throughout North America, these people that were, were literally pushed to the brink of losing their culture, that have, have were able to sort of step back from that brink. Um, and now are engaged in this whole process, as you said, growing up with that sense of responsibility, um, that, that it's their job to synthesize the traditional culture um, with the new problems that are coming up. So I think that that really, to me, is where the, where the modeling behavior is, because we're in a very similar situation now, where we are sort of being pushed to the brink, and we need to, to sort of step back um, and go back to more uh, traditional ways of doing things to set back to I think that's a really good model. Um, I'm interested in finding out too, like, you know, there's, uh, there's kind of a new movement among uh, Indian tribes towards casinos and, uh, you know, acquisition of wealth, American stuff. Um, and at the same time, I see this other kind of fork that is trying to um, hold on to the old traditions and, you know, remember the languages and songs and dances and all that kind of stuff. So for, for me, there's kind of this juxtaposition going on between uh, a split in the culture. So I'm kind of interested to hear your perspective yeah. on that. And I'll have to go ahead. He's the father of my childhood friend. Yeah, no, 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 <laughs> since you were like five or something. Can I address that really quickly? Or do you, you no. should, okay. Um, okay, so a little bit about where I speak from as well. So when I was 17, I got very involved in sort of the international indigenous movement. Um, a lot of people, including Native peoples, don't know that there is an international indigenous movement going on um, that is mutually supportive across nation state borders. Um, do you guys know that there's an indigenous president in Bolivia? 
um, that Indigenous presence in Bolivia was um, supported and backed by Indigenous people hemispherically. Um, so, so I've been kind of working in this movement since I was 17. I've been talking to people from all over the place. And you know what I've noticed about that? So here, I remember growing up in the, uh, you know, the casino. It was a, it was a little fight in the native community about whether to do that. Or not. Um, the casino going in has ended up providing lots of scholarships and buying back land and building housing and all these other wonderful, wonderful things. Um, but okay, so I'm I'm young, relatively. I'm 31 years old. Um, what we have noticed is that in my mom's generation. In my grandparents' generation, um, a lot. My, you know, my grandparents grew up without, uh, without anything. You know, a lot of our grandparents grew up hungry, um, and with nothing. Getting to the point where not only do you have enough political power to defend your land, but economic power to not be hungry. And I'll, it doesn't matter what culture you're from. Like, if you come from a family that has had hardship, there's that first generation out of the hardship that they just want the status quo. They want to feed their kids. They want a nice house. They want a big fat TV. They want, they want, they want it because they they saw it all around them. They were never able to have it because of whatever reasons, right? So there's that first, and, and some, not everybody goes through that, but a lot of people go through that. Um, those are a lot of our tribal leaders who, they want the casino in. They are sick of, not of, of HUD homes. You know, I would, you know, they're sick of HUD homes. They're sick of not having electricity. I don't know if people know this, but, you know, there are plenty of reservations that did not have running water or electricity, you know, in the 80s before you know, things happen. And actually, it's, very, it's a small percentage of tribes that actually has it, you know, so they just get a lot of publicity. Um, so, but as a 30-something year old who does talk to a lot of other people all over Indian country, um, what we kind of see is you know, we don't want to degrade those decisions. Um, I think that you need money in this world. And a lot of people were just trying to do what they could do to get their people out of the situation that they were in. Um, now, now people, some tribes have money and are figuring out what to do with it. If you've never had money, then sometimes people make stupid mistakes because they don't know what to, you know, what to do with it. There's, there's, um, I won't go into all of that. That's a whole other body. Um But I do see a very strong movement in people in my generation um, that are starting now to come into tribal leadership um, to come up with different ways of supporting our tribes. Some tribes have some tribes have a lot of resource access, traditional resource access, a lot of um, things, and sometimes don't. Sometimes we're kicked out into the desert in lands that are completely foreign to them and have no basic economic. Ability, other than, you know. So, um, but people want to move, we're, we're figuring that one out. Um, I think that that the decisions were a result of people. And I think it's great that, you know, they uh, had economic success through the casinos and, and allowed to, uh, you know, gain some, some power through that. I mean, I, I actually, I tried to live as an American, like an American, me and me for six years. You know, I lived in teepees and wiki ups and learned how to tan buckskin. and I was at the the Lander you know, hippie, uh, you know, trying, sitting in sweat lodges and doing all that kind of stuff. And, and I, I got some kind of appreciation for the difficulty, although I, you know, I, I don't really want to say that because I, I know I have no sense of the true difficulties that Indians living on reservations ever went through. But, you know, just from a physical standpoint of seeing, you know, can, can you hunt a deer and can you put meat on the table and then actually make your own clothes? I mean, uh, that was a real eye-opener and it, it was a challenge. And, um, I think I gained a respect for Indian culture through, through doing that and uh, knew that that was, you know, not a real viable lifestyle for, for me. And, uh, <laughs> you know, and, and I, but I still have this um, romantic desire, I guess, to see, 
to see some people uh, doing that and to see uh, native cultures preserving some of that heritage. And, uh, you know, so I mean, I, I think the economic side of casinos uh, maybe is providing that opportunity uh, for, the, for people to retain their culture and, and uh, you know, actually focus on preserving language and stuff like that. But, you know, I'm, I'm just, I guess I don't have a good sense of how many people in the Indian community are moving in that direction and how many of them are maybe moving more towards like white society and type of culture. I think we are over on the whole moving towards a real profound cultural revitalization of my tribe and I'm just on the things about that. And I think that that's where we're going. Um, it's, you know, people, people go through what they go through. Yeah. But, uh, you know, change, change takes a while. He's totally ready, but yeah. I want to get into what is indigenous, but I'll get into that later. Well, we will certainly come back to that. Oh, yeah. So that's more problem. Uh, can I recommend closing the drapes? Uh, uh, both in and back. Uh, you might be able to see it better. Um, what I want to uh, uh, is best. Thank you for these. Penless, thank you for filling in. I appreciate it. Um, sorry about the technical difficulties, but it all went very well. Uh, I wanted to just give you a little background on Frank Lake. Um, Frank Lake, uh, Dr. Frank Lake now, uh, is a group tribal member uh, from Forks of Salmon that is um, quite a ways up, uh, up river from uh, the Hoopa and Yurok tribes. For those of you who know this area, it's, it's towards the Siskiyous. It's a little bit higher country. And he is, uh, I would say, a traditional uh, practice a practitioner uh, who does uh, basket weaving and works with medicinal herbs and so forth, but he also works with the Forest Service. And he's a PhD in ethnobiology. And I heard a presentation given by him uh, about two or three months ago at Sandy Bar Ranch up in Orleans, and I was completely knocked out by what he had to say. And he's going to be talking about the indigenous adaptation wisdom of uh, specifically having to do with fire and some of the practices by local tribes use for maintaining their environment through the use of fire and uh, adaptive strategies they develop. When this is over, we'll come back to penalties and then pick up where she left off. Hi, and welcome to Building Greens Communities Conference. My name is Frank Kanawa Lake, and I'll be talking on indigenous adaptation wisdom, traditional ecological, ecological knowledge, tribal resource management in the Klamath Siskiyou region. A little bit of background about myself. I'm mixed Native American and Mexican American. I was raised here in Northwestern California, um, primarily with my Yurok and Karuk family. And those are a lot of the cultural traditions and practices that I grew up with, and that now I bring forward into my research. Um, I finished a Bachelor of Science at University of California Davis in Fisheries and Aquatic Ecology with a Native American Studies minor. Worked as a habitat fish biologist for the U.S. Forest Service and then for the Hoopa tribe. And then after coming to the understanding of how I was going to restore fisheries, particularly salmon and other anatomous fish here in the Pacific Northwest and in California, I need to understand fire. And so in order to understand fire, I was recruited to Oregon State University where I entered an environmental science program there and completed my PhD in 2007, which looked at natural and cultural historical fire regimes and the application of tribal community forestry for fire and fuels management. And so that's what I'll be talking generally about today in the context of climate change and kind of a community tribal-based approach to resilience and the management regimes that both interface um, humans as well as the natural environment. So as an overview, here's the Klamath Siskiyou bioregion, both the mountains and the rivers and the tribes. The left map depicts the Klamath bioregion, and the right map basically shows the tribes from southwestern Oregon and northwestern California. Unique to this biophysical conditions of this resource area were the tribes that had similar adaptive practices that graded both from the coast, the marine environment, both to the interior, as well as from north to south, but because of the template of how the geology the topography, the climate, the rivers and the forest, and other resources that are found there, tribes had very similar adaptations, some of which I'll be talking about during this presentation. So just what are some of those cultural adaptations? Well, 
in order to context to think about how people live in place, and a lot of these tribes have been here for thousands of years, they've definitely seen changes in climate and have had to make adaptive strategies about how they're going to relate to and get the resources they need from their environment. And so some of these ecological adaptations were, could be fishing, if you've seen here in the upper left of the photo, many different anatomous fish at different times of the years also provided an important resource. Transportation was important. I'll talk somewhat about not only river networks, but also ridge systems and trail networks. The center picture talks about high, historical high family camps. People not only went from the villages, but the higher elevations. And then when we look on the right and then down to the lower right part of the picture, we're looking at the traditional houses, split plank houses that were permanent villages with seasonal uses of the uplands and other environments. But there was a variety of ways that people essentially acquired resources and expressed their wealth. And that could be in the basketry traditions, it could be in the world renewal ceremonies, or it can be even things as far as uh, homeland security, there even down to the warrior uh, with, his, with his armor and the different things that they did to protect themselves, not only from natural disturbances, but also from outside influences and, and factors. So how was these practices embodied? Well, within tribal communities, there's this term called traditional ecological knowledge. And perhaps there's an academic definition, but kind of more from a community perspective, it's a cumulative body of knowledge that's passed down intergenerationally with respect to a resource and place in the context of acquiring resources, processing resources, and utilizing those resources with a fine eye towards diversity, landscape processes, as well as how the context of the individual's responsibility for managing and taking care of those resources. And so that's really what embodies traditional ecological knowledge. That traditional ecological knowledge, or TEK, is employed or carried out with a term I developed called cultural environmental management practices. And cultural environmental management practices are those practices employed by indigenous peoples, often mimicking natural disturbance processes in the management and utilization of natural resources. Some people also call these indigenous land use practices or Native American management or traditional resource management. But essentially it's how you put to work the knowledge you have. These cultural environmental management practices mimic natural, physical, and biological processes, fire being one of them, but differing from the natural type of fire, both in seasonality and the location, in animals, the extent and duration might differ. It can help buffer against extreme ranges of natural variability, and it can help also foster biodiversity and productivity, and it has many applications for restoration or increasing resilience today. And so, again, it's the knowledge that you have about place and how you go about employing that knowledge for various practices that helps build community as well as ecological resilience. It was a refinement of this traditional knowledge and these practices through time that led to the maintenance and or the enhancement of ecosystem diversity and productivity. It can help increase resilience from the individual to the community. And whether that individual is on the socio-political side of it or the cultural side of it, or from the environmental or ecological side of it, it's the detailed knowledge you have that takes into consideration not only what you need as a human being, but also considering what the natural system needs or those species out in the environment need as well. These effects can vary spatially, uh, where they're distributed across the landscape, temporally, the time frame from seasonal to annual to even the lifetime of an individual, or practices that are replicated and adaptive that span intergenerations, along with the knowledge base about having that relationship with place. And intensity, or the effect of that management, can really vary across the landscape for any given resource, from the rivers to the highest ridges. So let's think about levels of biodiversity and fire as a cultural environmental management practice. Using this diagram here by Kat Anderson, we think about tribal adaptive practices ranged in the scale from the patches to stands to watersheds with individuals to populations of communities across the landscape. So we might focus on a particular organism of interest. It could be a basketry shrub that makes up a part of a population that fits into a network of communities that's in found, that is then found across the landscape. And so there is an aspect of scale to this. And fire as a main ecological disturbance process that will likely be affected by climate for many parts of the world, in particular here in Northern California in the Klamath Mountains, we need to be considerate of that scale and the effects from the organism or the individual across the community, even to the greater landscape. The premise of some of these knowledge and practices really come down to 
certain indigenous worldviews. And I want to share one here with you. It's the worldview of nature as your hardware store, your supermarket, your pharmacy, and your church, deriving all aspects of everything you need from your local environment with importing actually very little. And to be able to do that, you have to have adaptive strategies, you have to think about the resilience or the capacity that you have and the pressures you exert on your resources. Those really relate to ecological services and the goods that are procured from your environment. That's founded upon ecological diversity and productivity, which in a tribal philosophy equaled wealth, good health, and survival in the context of being sustainable. Uses of the environment that promoted or maintained ecological integrity and services not only for humans, but for non-human species as well. And really this founded or was rooted in people of place as part of being indigenous, but also reaffirming from a tribal perspective their responsibility to the creator and to the animals. So in many of the native people's creation accounts, when they came to place, it was the animals, the plants, the rocks, the land itself, and the waters, and all the other elements that provided the original instruction of how to live in place. And so tribal people carrying that, carrying that knowledge and those instructions forward, when we think about being people of place, what we do today can very well lead to a legacy of effects down the road and into the future through a world renewal process. And when we think about it in the context of our legacy, it's our grandchildren as our effectiveness monitors. If what we're doing today has a lasting legacy, so we have to do what we do carefully and thoughtfully. That's founded upon the premise of respect and reciprocity. Again, I touched upon the creation accounts, the transfer of knowledge, and having responsibility for that knowledge based upon natural laws that often limit or put constraints on human behavior that adds a certain level of resilience to buffering human and environmental relationships. It was played out or took its form in ritualized forms of management, whether it's the world renewal ceremonies or the first salmon ceremonies or first acorn ceremony. Many tribes had celebration ceremonies of first fruits, first animals, and of natural systems and cycles that fed into them reaffirming their responsibility to place, but also a remembrance of with that responsibility comes a relationship with, with that place that you're living in. And then this other aspect of that was payment or retribution. Although maybe perhaps a social construct between tribal, tribal individuals or tribal groups of families was before you go about and fixing the world is that you have to come to terms of your disagreements, agree to disagree, make payment, make, make right for what maybe has been done wrongs or certain violations and then be able to move forward collectively to help fix and maintain your world. Some of these have applications for what I consider are the ethics of permaculture kind of compared to the tribal world renewal way of life. And so I'm going to draw some analogies here. These are based upon care of the earth, also care of the people. Returning some of the surplus, only taking what you need and don't waste. Um, the design is overlaid on a landscape that's created by natural or creator's laws and really it's human's responsibility to that place. And through that, it's enacted through a series of principles such as you observe and you adapt, you see what's happening and you act accordingly. You have respectful resource utilization, waste management, again, use only what you need. Have a balanced use and return, again, something giving back, it might even be a concept that would fit back to nutrient cycling with your use of fire. Energetically efficient, and this is one I think that people may um, have a harder time understanding, but if you're utilizing fire in a productive way, it's energetically efficient to manage a lot of different diverse habitats and a lot of different communities, but at the same time, it's providing many different services. The law of reciprocity, essentially, again, you take responsibility for what you're doing in the context of what's best for the environment and for your community. You have multiple functions. You do something with an objective, but it can also have multiple objectives and thinking about the implications or the trade-offs of what happens with any activity that you do, another way of adding resilience to your activities and then really with the goal of maximizing diversity and productivity. And again, this is adapted by Bill Mollison and David Holmberg for some of the work that they've done. And this was embodied in the idea of a living landscape. Now, this photo depicts many different basket materials and traditional foods like nuts and acorns, but really it was from river to ridge, all these different resources and the worldview of tribal people that it was a living landscape and no other better way to maintain resilience and then to make sure that that living, continual relationship takes place. So to provide some scale to this, 
If we look here at this photo, this old river, this river bar terrace here is the site of an old village. And from that village was a main home, home area all the way back to some of those first few ridges you had localized management effects for various resources. Now if you go to the highest elevations, again along a network of trails and areas going from the villages along the rivers up to the high country, even the high country had sacred places and biodiversity that were recognized. And often people found solitude and had ways of going up there for special purposes that then they could communicate with spirits and with that land to essentially put in the context of who they are as a human being. And so just to put in context for tribal people, these sacred places and some of this high country was very important to them and provides that framework or the foundation for looking at the landscape. So how do we think about you know, adaptation to climate change and this continuum of maybe a gradient from more human management to more of a wilderness idea? We could think about it kind of along the continuum of wild to cultivated. Now on the left side of this figure, it's wild nature. Transitioning to the transit, trans, we'll go back there. So when we think about this, we'll look at it from the continuum of the wild to the cultivated. On the left side of this figure, you see wild nature. And then transitioning to the right, you have a forest garden, you have an orchard, a pasture, to then annual cultivation. Well, in the context of where I'm at here in Northern California or any place across the globe, it's really kind of this continuum of wild to cultivated. And it's the inner relationship that people play with that, that buffer against extreme changes in the natural variability that might be exacerbated or made worse by climate change. So in many ways you want to think about the energy expenditure, how you make it more resilient, how you make it more diverse, the interconnectedness between these gradients, and then also thinking about the scale. To think about here about what most people might be thinking about as a wildland situation, this figure on the right um, by Kat Anderson and Michael Barber shows three different scenarios for this similar piece of ground or similar forest type just under a difference of natural and human fires. The top one depicts a lightning fire regime where we have a variety of oaks and pines, grasses and forbs with a certain amount of fuel continuity and understory. The middle figure depicts more full crown oaks and pines many ways those trees that are also more adapted to fire and more resilient to expected fire induced climate uh, change. So we take that back. The middle slide, yeah, I'm sure you're going to edit all this. Moving to the middle part of this figure, you can see here it has more oaks and more pines, many species of which are also more fire adapted, but also could be more resilient to expected climate change because of the way that they use water and their efficiency, but also how they can buffer and handle fire through there. The middle of the picture shows more full crown oaks and pines that provided more food resources for tribal people, but also there's also a lush understory of grasses and forbs that provided medicines and other foods. Now the bottom part of this figure shows essentially the effect of fire suppression, the removal of both lightning and Native American ignitions and essentially we see a degradation of this habitat or this forest type, a buildup of fuels and also its increased vulnerability to catastrophic fire or to fire that could perhaps under climate change with a longer fire season, with a more buildup of fuels uh, because of droughty conditions, more of the vegetation is more prone to disease and bugs, this one being likely to be affected more so by a fire uh, having negative consequences. So we think about this principle, integrating concepts from the forest garden for multiple purpose fuels reduction, again kind of bringing some of the historical practices in a contemporary context. Let's look at agroforestry and hazardous fuels reduction and this figure here essentially shows that you can have thicker forest of different species and different structure and composition or you can have a thinner forested area by reducing the surface and ladder fuels, you increase resilience from the time that a fire could come through there, ignite, and then go up into the canopy, something that maybe isn't necessarily desired. And then also at the same time as you're managing the surface fuels and the ladder fuels, you can increase the yield of products by implementing the wildland fire at an appropriate season or frequency. Tree density affects understory potential. And if you look in this figure going from left to right, uh, on the left side, the top part of the figure is the aerial view looking down on the forest type. Very open space crown with a lot of understory potential. 
The bottom figure kind of shows it from the side profile view, looking at the grasses and forbs. Again, that's your foods, your medicines, your materials. The center figure, again, shows a little bit more densely, densely clustered forest type. Perhaps it's also increasing its fire risk or its potential to be affected by fire um, under more severe conditions. And then the one on the right is also another reconfiguration, perhaps showing different age classes and different structure. Each of these forests affected by climate are going to have different responses if they burn, but also they can have different responses through their nutrient cycling, perhaps uh, their ability to withstand certain drought or being stressed by water, and also the goods and services that they provide for both human and ecological purposes. Talk about climate and precipitation regime. This is something that likely climate is going to affect. And if we could look at climate models for different areas and scale those down, all the way down to individual trees or the stand, we have to think about the function of forest. Now, the crown architecture or the branching structure is an inherent adapt, uh, natural adaptive uh, response that trees have to their growing environment. But it also affects the way that precipitation, whether it's snowpack or rainfall, likely is going to reach the surface and infiltrate and then become the spring flow later on during the season or during the year. If we think about the distribution of forest from low elevation to high elevation, as well as what's likely going to happen to the climate, it's expected, at least for this region in some places, that we'll have a warmer winter, which means that the average elevation for snow to rain interface is going to move higher in elevation. That has some in, in, uh, effects and impacts to potentially to the snowpack, but also how we manage the forest also can relate to how that snow or that precipitation reaches the ground and affects downstream beneficial uses of water. A way to think about um, the different management variables and the different techniques and the different harvesting variables is shown here by Kat Anderson and her figure. And we think about all these different practices affecting the native plant community and with the practice of employing your traditional knowledge, it can lead to a renewable resource and have conservation implications. Or it can essentially, if you take almost a hands-off approach, although you think that might be best in some natural way or natural sense, it could actually lead to extirpation or a reduction in the productivity and abundance of that resource. So there's different tribal harvesting practices that help renew the resource and it's the appropriate scale in which those were employed under different conditions that added resilience to the system. In the context of ecological goods and services, this concept by Crawford for the forest garden, there's many different uses here. So in this figure we have the forest garden central to providing our foods, our medicines, our materials. Um, and that can range from all kinds of things, from wood products, for firewood, for crafts, seeds and nuts for consumption, uh, dyes, salad materials, many different things that will come from our forest garden in the context of ecological goods and services. If we think about agroforestry and an application to forest gardening, here's some of the summaries, the benefits to forest gardening, as again restated by Crawford. Working with the land instead of against it, a low maintenance and high efficiency, a wide range of products that are yield, and then resilience to climate extremes and changes to weather. Again, thinking about seasonal variability through often played out through many years to a longer cycle. Thinking about biological sustainability and the environmental benefits that might occur at different spatial and temporal scales as well. Being aesthetically beautiful. When you look out there and you have birds singing, there's lush flowers and fruits and a, and a bounty, that provides a sense of security for you, your family, your community, but also the relationship that you're helping foster for that place that you live. And then there's some also some commercial possibilities of thinking about the bounty that you've helped create or work with that might offset or also help economic resilience of your community directly reflecting the ecological integrity of the place you live. And then really some things to consider is this is achievable at what scale? At the individual, family, or the community all working together in various ways. So adapting your capacity to available area. Again, some of these summary things, again from the forest gardens is, if they mimic young forest and structure, considerable multi multiple age classes. That helps add variety, and variety is also some ways of resilience factor. Um, here, that there's high diversity, a range of products, whether it's foods, materials, and medicines that are produced from your forest garden. And then uh, something he touches on here is, they usually have edges where light levels are higher. 
These are ecotones, and many of these ecotones are intersections of patches that lead to productive mosaics, and we know when we have more spatial heterogeneity, that is another level of resilience in the face of predicted climate change. We're not putting all our eggs in one basket, we're spreading it out from various ways. Um, and also thinking about clearings are possible within larger gardens. Again, maybe looking at the garden plot or the family farm or ranch level, but applying that to the landscape is all elevations across all different habitats. It's just not right next to the community or where you live, but thinking about the same framework from here to the highest backcountry wilderness areas. Now I'm going to start with and talk about indigenous or cultural fire regimes. This was essentially how fire was utilized, but also looking at natural fire and working with that. There was manipulation of fuel types by manual removal or placement um, and intentional burning. Ignition patterns, going out and burning a certain way to achieve a single or multiple objectives. That led to predictable effects and produced ecological goods and services, as well as worked with our enhanced nature's inherent capacity or the nat natural services. Frequencies with which fires were set and reset over various periods of time. We see and expect under a changing climate regime that perhaps fire frequencies will become more, more, more frequent. And so that's going to have certain changes. It's likely to lead to early serial stage habitat, our younger forests, or a renewal of certain grasslands, our early forests and shrublands. We think about that in the context too. Alternate seasons of burning for different kinds of settings. Vegetation responds to fire, whether it's in its dormant or its active growing. So the time or the season in which it's burned also can have a legacy or, or, or resulting effects. And then thinking about specific locations, the firing or those areas being burned and others that aren't. Sometimes you would like fire to be in an area because that can help increase its resilience. Sometimes you might fireproof or burn around an area to keep fire out of an area that does perhaps better without fire. Kind of fireproofing that to protect the value of our target or resource. Corresponding intensities in which fuels can be burned. Uh, in some cases you want a higher intense intensity um, that can lead to a variety of different types of severities, low, moderate, or high, which are an effect on the landscape for that burn patch. And then a range of natural and artificial controls that humans employed in limiting the spread of fires, such as the time of day, the winds, the fuels, the slope, relative humidity, and natural and human fire breaks. So let's talk about some of those cultural fire regime principles and those practices and put them in the context of the landscape. So for this one, if we look at historical tribal ignition patterns, understanding the extent why, where, and when tribal people would have burned in the context of the Klamath Mountains, there was a higher proportion below 3,500 feet. There was also some limited or selected areas above 3,500 feet. Uniquely so, and also probably to the Klamath Mountains because of its rugged topography, as well as this might apply to other Mediterranean climates around the world that have very steep and rugged topography, is that there is an inversion layer. And this usually also follows kind of that, that average snow rainfall level uh, elevationally. We see changes in the extent of fires or the fire patterns above and below this kind of mid-elevation point. Specific habitats for tribal people Proximity to water, there's, you know, uh, biologically more diverse areas around bodies of water. Tribal people targeted and still have affinity for those places. Favoring oak and grasslands, oaks and pines, or transitional repairing meadow habitats where some of those places next to water also. Certain south-facing aspects were favored. Also, it might have been other places at different elevations. Um, and in the slope position, many ridge tops or mid-slope benches or terraces were also places that they utilized fire. They didn't just go around burning the whole landscape, but were very selective in particular about trying to use fire for certain resource objectives. And this example here on the top right shows a picture of a Hoopaw family in the Trinity Alps, Trinity Summit area, um, back in the early 1900s. And you can see a, a burn pattern in the background there. Uh, in that same context of the place, you see in the lower, lower photo, old growth forest next to an open meadow prairie area. Again, with the cultural use of fire at the right time, right conditions, you can help increase the ecotonal edge and have a variety of serial stages or time since burn that increase the diversity and productivity. And if you think about stand replacement fires, by having these meadows or prairies that were burned at certain times when the adjacent forest wouldn't, you essentially help break up the distribution of fuel and protect against some perhaps climatically driven, more extreme conditions or fire behavior. 
Again, to recap on some of the vegetation or habitats of the cultural fire management practices for the western Klamath Siskiyou Mountains, below 3,500 feet, focusing on oak and prairies, um, which had a lot of hunting or other Indian potatoes and food resources, tan oak orchards on ridges and mid slopes provided nuts, berries, and mushrooms in hunting, the black oak and California hazel were important for basket material, for herbs, medicine plants, and also hunting. Certain southern aspects were favored. Again, this breaks up kind of the landscape topography with areas that you burned are favored in your burning regime. And then we find those higher elevation areas, again, where we see different fire landscape patterns, usually attributed more to lightning ignitions. Tribal people would burn along key main ridges or sub ridges, usually along trails or these travel routes. They favored sugar and ponderosa pine stands that provided nuts, basket material, or other habitats that were associated, the other associates of that habitat provided berries and medicinal plants and herbs. The meadows were important for hunting and for gathering areas. And in some of these brush fields, when they were encroached by conifers, by burning out those areas, often resulting in a little bit higher intensity or severity, actually also served another ecological purpose, rejuvenating brush and providing forage and allowing a lot of the forbs and grasses to recolonize areas or maintain site dominance and otherwise which would have been more shrubs and conifer trees or other forest. This all comes together in thinking about the key ecological processes and functions that are part of this fire-induced ecological goods and services, focusing centrally on food, water, and materials. Again, seasonality was important, the frequency, the desired intensity or severity, the specificity or the extent of how big of an areas were burned, that relates to the topography or the condition of the fuels, and then really the ignition, whether it was lightning during the summer and late summer, or tribal burning at different times of the years. Incorporating and integrating all these together could help buffer against climatically driven otherwise severe fire weather conditions and things that we need to consider for our future for our resilience, both socially and culturally, but also ecologically for the resources we depend upon. To, to look at and focus on some of the key Indian burning practices, um, I define those as enduring uses of fire by Indians in pre and post European settlement that resulted in changed or stabilized landscape scale vegetation patterns. Again, this is some work that Dr. Bob Zyback and myself developed, and these Indian burning practices are characterized by firewood, by patch, and broadcast burning. To think about the broadcast burning element of it, I'll get to that next. To think about the firewood part of it, let's think about in the context of this patch. People utilized fuel wood. They had to gather different trees and different materials, some cooking wood, some heating wood, some food preservation for smoking meats or preparing things. But you had to generate and get that fuel from someplace. And it was often tied to patches. So here in this figure by uh, anthropologist Krober of a Yurok village, if we look at this hillside and this figure to the right, you'll see the different color little squiggly lines showing different patches. You have open prairie which provided certain hunting, certain root grounds or, or geophytes. You have adjacent to that an old growth forest that provided other resources, fuel wood, construction material. Then you have a variety of inner mosaic or interlocking patches that form the mosaic pattern of different serial stages all producing foods and medicines and materials. And so really for patch burning, it was a specific application of fire to fuels within a bounded area for food maintenance, utility, or travel. And again, clearing out where you want to go to the places and the things you need to get. For broadcast burning, it's the practice of setting fire to the landscape for multiple purposes with general boundaries. And so looking at here, um, this example for Ch Cholula and Yurok tribal boundary and present day Ribbon National Park where they're reinstating and maintaining ethnographic landscapes with the use of fire. It provided many different resources and enhanced those resources. It could be forage, roots and bulbs, travel safety along the trail route, hunting enhancement, acorns on another leeward or different aspect side of the hillside where oaks were found, or the berry foods as well as medicines. This is a short list of some of the many reasons why tribal people use fire. Um, this work being building upon Gerald Williams and that of Hank Lewis, but there was hunting, crop management, insect collection, pest management, range improvement or range management, fireproofing areas, clearing areas for travel, firewood or fuel wood, clearing repairing areas, and also basket material. And I'll just touch upon a few of these in the next part of the presentation. So we've given an overview of some of the historical practices. 
Many tribal people today, in order to protect their communities, protect values at risk, they're working to fire and fuels managers, whether it's federal agencies, state agencies, watershed organizations, or fire safe councils, tribal community members, to come together to strategically look at where's the most effective area to design treatments with available funding to increase resilience. Well, you need to protect life, property, and resources, and so there's a grading or a strategic way you're gonna go about thinking about where you come together to focus on places. Often because of our societal demands or our concern for infrastructure and for our life and property, that happens when the wildland urban interface or the WUI. And so here's an example of strategic treatments at various locations on the landscape. Focus on the land ownership areas. Again, this could be around your ranch or farm or your town or the edge of your community. Think about it in the context of the elevational range. The slope aspect or position is also important because that affects the forest type or the overall climatic or weather conditions that have an effect on the fuels or the vegetation that you're basically within. And then thinking about the objectives or the, of the treatments or your prescribed burns to protect life, property, and or even enhance the resources. So in this example on the photo on the right, we're looking up at the hillside where this prescribed burn took place earlier in the day. And then to zoom in to the lower, fit, lower photo there, we see the fire coming as an understory burn. And really this one burn as a broadcast burn um, is along a strategic road route, is near a person's home. And so for this private landowner, working with the basket weavers and the fire safe council, and then also with applying for and getting the permits from air quality, from the government agencies to conduct a burn, it's enhancing the basket material, other cultural food products, berries, and then wildlife forage. And it's also meeting the main objective, which is protecting the, the, the property and the, uh, the resources at risk that would have otherwise been at risk from a wildfire there. Clearing areas for travel. Um, just to look at the map on the right, this is of the Klamath area. It's a little hard to see, but basically it shows a continuum of villages all along the river corridor, the green being Karuk villages, the golden uh, triangles on the lower left being the Yurok villages. The red show a network of trails that radiate out from low elevation river corridors all the way up to the highest elevations. And essentially these travel corridors or these travel areas were where Indians used fire to maintain and clear overgrown trails for travel. They served as their ignition locations and also as fuel breaks. And then they also modified uh, the conditions of the fuels around there. So today when we're thinking about contemporary landscape fire planning and adding resilience to protect our community and also other key or critical resources, there's often what I would say is a, is a, is a cultural legacy that's imprinted or still within the ecological potential of that landscape. Many of these areas, because they were managed for centuries by tribal people, and it's just been within the last century that we've had the effect of fire suppression and fire exclusion, targeting these same places is a good way to start for prioritization of our restoration, but also thinking about how we begin to adapt and strategically think about fire and fuels treatment to, to look at what's going to happen predictable-wise with climate change. So here's an example of the landscape zone clusters, looking at tribal burning, vegetation patterns and resource enhancement. And this is just an area outside of Orleans in the community that I live along the mid lower Klamath River and thinking about the network of the trails and also this idea within permaculture of zones. Now, you can have overlapping zones or areas of priority because many forests or different vegetation can offer different resources through different seasons at different times since fire was used there. And so the quote here from interviews that were done with tribal uh, people from the U.S. Forest Service, they quote, the best grasses were found in the mountain areas that had been burned. This ridge was, fav was a favorite procurement area. Acorns were gathered on the north face, huckleberries and mushrooms on the ridge, deer and elk were hunted on the south side. So again, it provides some context of just that one hillside ridge, the many different uses there. And trails connected the villages to these camp areas for different seasons. To focus on basket material, this is a critical resource for many indigenous groups, particularly for California Indians and also those in the Pacific West. Most of the basket materials required fire to promote the plant structure or health. Now, if you look at the woman in the lower figure there with all those shoots, if you think about like in the case of California hazel as an understory plant in our forest, we might just look out across the forest and think, oh, that's just a, a native plant. Um, it has this branching architecture, but from a tribal perspective, 
having those nice long straight shoots of all nice even size, you're going to need hundreds of different shrub plants burned at the right time and season and right time of year that are going to create thousands of shoots to make many different baskets for any given year. And so when you look at the top right picture there, the uniformity of all those baskets with the overlay material, that's because so many of those shoots are almost the same size, same diameter, same length, the same taper. And you only get that by understanding the local condition of that shrub or that plant growing within its environment, the appropriate time and application of fire, and then being there at the right time when you can harvest it to peel it and utilize it. And so really, when you look at a well-constructed basket, it represents uh, an amazing amount of knowledge about seasonal variation, fire effects, and plant adaptive, adaptive traits that are influenced through that traditional knowledge and the use and the architecture to be able to weave such a, such a craft and such a vessel for basket, baskets and the basket material you use. To think about resilience in the context of how you manage those understory native plants that have many cultural as well as ecological functions, look here at basket management and plant community structure. Again, looking at Kat Anderson's work here, she shows the start of the shrubs that are often kinky with many side branches. They might have lichens or insects or diseases. They could be weak from often not having much of a rejuvenation or a renewal process. But if you step in there, you add some disturbance such as burning or coppicing. It can rejuvenate the shrub, give you those nice long straight shoots, and if you harvest them, you can kind of continue that, re, that renewal cycle, um, providing the material you need, or if you basically remove that human management element um, or that disturbance in a productive good way, it can essentially lead to uh, the decreasing of that or uh, the death of that resource. And so again, part of the resilience is putting it in a scale and a context of keeping those things living that you depend upon in the framework of their own adaptive traits and, and, and conditions. An example here, um, close to home literally here, is looking off my back porch on my neighbor's adjacent property where we worked with the Fire Safe Council and the adjacent landowner to not only protect the fuel loading behind my home um, and my property there, but also looking at the adjacent neighbor's property. And so really we looked here at the wildland urban interface. We thought of fire safety and food security was, a, was mainly our part of our object, objective there. The greatest threat or fuel load of wildfire was from the adjacent property, not necessarily mine. We worked with a neighbor and a fire safe council to reduce the fuel load. First, it involved understory thinning. Part of that went through. Um, part of increasing resilience, I would say, here is an important element, is having ecological workforce training. You have to have the people that are implementing the forest management to be able to understand and be able to relate. Oh, this particular tree or that particular shrub or this plant has certain inherent social, cultural, as well as ecological value. And so therefore we decide to retain it or we decide to remove it from the system can have an effect on its function after the treatment. That was followed up with pile burning to reduce the initial fuel loading there to be able to get in to be able to work. And then came back a year or two later and did the broadcast burn. And after the smoke clears, you can look back up there through the forest up to the top of my house in the bottom photo, and then along that ground below, you can see the acorns, in this case, tan oak acorns there. So after the smoke clears, collecting acorns and maintaining the culture is by timing the fire just right in the fall, again, based on a traditional burn regime and season and frequency of fire brought into a modern context. First, it's the infertile and the buggy or pest infected acorns that fall. Then if you come in and burn, you reduce that fuel bed but also consume those pests and then blacken that surface which recycles and returns some of the nutrients and then when the good acorn crop dro drops later that fall it's easy to harvest and you can see all those little white top acorns looking up at you saying collect me collect me i'm pest free relatively pest free and that's one energetic return back to the community and so you results in a clear understory a reduction in the surface and ladder fuels um, the bad acorns are burnt and it, good acorns are easy pickings. To think about some of the tribal community desires to continue traditional management practices, it's going to focus on culturally significant habitats. Also besides focusing on those culturally significant habitats distributed across the landscape is having access for potential management, working across land ownership boundaries from private to tribal to state to um, federal agency or public lands and then really incorporating contemporary management systems to achieve our desired ecological conditions. 
So if you want to think about resilience, but also food security, how do you manage your huckleberries or the forest that contains huckleberries in a way that fits in with your fire and fuels management, but also has the byproduct of increased berry yield? It's a lot of good nutrients and um, antioxidants just in the huckleberries there that came from a byproduct of fuels management. We think about the basket material, an example I already talked about there, and then you have to work with the fire management agencies to make sure on public lands they're aware of your values or the other interests you have for management of fire and fuels on public lands. And often with tribal community people, it's going out there and collecting and utilizing that resource and maintaining that intergenerational relationship to place. So in the context of thinking about things and perhaps wrapping up here with some, with some thoughts, is really what you make of creating a resilient, what you make of creating a resilient future is adapting river to ridges. And so when we look out across the landscape from the river to the ridges, um, for me, uh, participating in my tribal community here, embodied in our ceremonies, literally from the ocean to the rivers to the forest to the highest um, montane or subalpine environments, embodied in our regalia is every, just about every plant and animal that is from a different plant community that's there. We have the, the shells, the, the baskets represent the plant people, the shells represent you know, a lot of the, the, the mollusk and the marine life. You have uh, the birds that are represented in the feather, the animal skins and the other regalia. Touches upon every habitat and every environment. And for tribal people, the expression of that ceremonial regalia was really a reflection of their ecological as well as cultural wealth. And so when we think about resilience, if we manage for, again, going back to that tribal philosophy of thinking about responsibility for the knowledge that we have and responsibility to place, we have to look at the context of how we make choices, how we implement that choices with our management practices, how we can increase and foster resilience at many different levels from the individual or from the population across the landscape and for our communities, and thinking about that now but also into the future for our grandchildren and for what we leave as a legacy. Because what we choose to do today is going to have an effect on how well future environmental conditions or how the community responds to those environmental conditions will be able to persist and have as well as themselves a certain amount of wealth and quality of life. So thank you with your involvement with Building Green Communities in this annual conference. And here's some of my contact information. Again, I'm with the US Forest Service Pacific Southwest Research Station. And uh, thank you for listening to what I had to say. Well, see, Frank is a fine example. Remember how I was saying people in my in the 30-something year old range are starting to, yeah. So Frank is a, is a fine example of that. Um, I also, I'm going to pass this around um, to you, just, just for your interest. Um, it's beaten up, because I've been carrying it around for a couple of years. Um, but it's called Climate Change Impacts, Adaptation, Mitigation, and Indigenous Peoples. And it was put together by a woman working at the United Nations University. And it is global what people are doing worldwide in indigenous communities um, to address these issues. The other thing is that I want to say before I get actually in my presentation is if people are interested in, uh, again, I work at the grassroots and in academia. So if anybody is interested in getting um, academia style publications and analyses of any of these things, call me, you know, again, or contact me. Um, I've got mad resources. If anybody is interested in what's finding out what's going on at the grassroots level internationally with indigenous sustainability, land tenure, politics, email me. I've got some great resources and contacts. So,
the world share some very profound um, commonality. Whether you're indigenous European or indigenous African or indigenous American or whatever that is. Could you speak up a little bit as your name can be heard by the group? Oh yeah, sorry. Thank you. I'm trying to get you on tape. Oh, okay. I got it. Oh, you beat me. Yep. Okay. for sustainable because I have an ecological, environmental engineering design background. Um, uh, so that's what, I'm, what I think about a lot. So uh, we talk about designing for the seventh generation. Who's heard of the seventh generation principle? It's pretty common. Um, that actually is written into um, every indigenous culture that I've met is this principle that you make decisions and you act in the best interests of not just your grandkids, but perpetual future. Um, that's profound, because that's you know, not the way we act today. I found this fabulous quote, design manifests culture, and culture rests firmly on the foundation of what we believe to be true about the world. Now, I, you know, things that are examples of design systems, well, the way your community is laid out, this building, this room, that chair, everything is a product of design. Everything. Single family dwelling, so we have this separateness thing going on in our culture. So, so I, want, I, want to, I want to hear a couple of things. The way, what beliefs are evident in our design systems? That can be anything, food systems, living systems, yes. I always think about how our structures, every everything we build is square and rectangle, and that's not the safest design in an earthquake or a hurricane or anything like that. A dome would be way better, but we believe that this is like the easiest, best solution, but it's just for a short term, not long term. Well, let's, what beliefs? I'm talking like philosophical perceptions aren't evident. Religious, you mean? Part of it. Anyone. Would you more efficient? Um, I'm going to practice the same kind of thing. What was yours? Monocultures are more efficient. Would be a belief, uh, a, a capitalistic belief that, that uh, maximize profit. Maximizing whatever profit is, um, um, monocultures are, are efficient. separate from nature mm -hmm. and, and uh, are, are allowed to control it. Uh, we don't have responsibility to the earth or to the planet that you know all our sins will be forgiven by this great deity and we can do whatever we want on earth. Uh, True. If in nature there are no straight lines that humans come up with straight lines, there's also an implicit uh, belief that we know better than nature. Right, that, that uh, you know, we don't even have to pay attention to how things are done in because we know better. So that's that's the belief there. Right? Yeah. And I'm not sure if this is quite in the direction that you're going, but yeah. there's often a sense of symmetry, a sense of that our design systems will bring us to desired goals. Um, trend in Germany, I guess in the early part of the last century, it was based on 
the fact that the, the physical space itself would uh, um, uh, modify behavior of the people living. That is actually a function of the digital concept. Also. Mm. So, so, yeah. Um, that uh, we shouldn't live in in a spaces that are designed for the vitality of life. <laughs> well, one, one more on that person. What if you just say in general uh, science over spirituality? That the world is going to end very soon and so we don't need to. <laughs> yeah. Keep thinking about the future, yeah. Well, one of the organizing myths of our culture was in Genesis 2.15, where after God created everything else but us, put us on, on the earth to guard, tend, and keep, to maintain the garden. And even Moses warned about worshiping the golden calf, and that's what happened. And we started doing mammon, and then crop deals for the short term and investment portfolios took over the slash and burn thing, and then a population exploded. And we're still doing slash and burn agriculture, horticulture, forestry, and we're screwed if we don't change. So <laughs> we've got to get back to the garden, basically. Yeah. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. The, the, the things that I'd like to um, to uplift and say, well, yeah, I mean, these are some some very serious principles. Are we are separate? Somehow, humans are separate from the things that give us life, and that we can control them. Or that is the belief, yes. Yeah, and that, that, that's, um, that's profound. So when you think about it, we've invented this society and these living systems where, that, where we are being fed by, you know, the, the, that, that element that we are removed cre creates uh, this society that we are we're being, uh, oh, and the resources are, are, are infinite. Right? Resources are infinite. Um, so here, here's these, these myths. Basically, that we have founded our society on. Um, so, as far as developing sustainable nations and this this idea that, uh, yeah. Sorry, I have one more. I just thought of, that things are disposable. Uh -huh. Things are disposable. Yeah. No, yeah, good one. That's a fabulous one. Um, so, as we created sustainable nations, we wanted to um, to uplift indigenous beliefs about the world and who we are as people as the foundation for the creation of any sustainable nation or community. Um, in my personal belief, you know, being indigenous, we are all indigenous to somewhere. And my idea of being indigenous is um, what makes what makes me Anishinaabe. I have a very mixed ancestry and wasn't even raised in a home of other people. Why am I Anishinaabe? Why am I from that indigenous group of people? Well, I'm indigenous to that group of people because I am part of the group of people that's been given the spiritual responsibility to my homeland back there and to my people back there. And that core value system and all that encompasses that, that is the foundation of my belief of who I am, my belief about my role in the community, and is the foundation for creating truly sustainable communities and nations with that philosophical belief. That's the principle that I operate from, um, and our organization operates from. So basically, our, our, our premise is that empowering and emerging indigenous relationships and responsibilities is the foundation of sustainable nation Yes. You know, even in, in the indigenous thing of the the, uh, the scriptures, they give God supposedly gave dominion over mankind, but also the responsibility to do stewardship, not to use it up. And we lost our way, so it's uh, it's in there too. Yeah, yeah. I was like, well, you'll probably see if you if people are interested in religious and spiritual um, uh, commonalities. I'm gonna I'm gonna tell you this just so you understand how this can actually play out. Um, I'm going to share um, a, little, a little bit of the Anishinaabe creation story. Um, again, uh, a lot of Native creation stories take a long, long time to even tell, um, but um, this is something that's allowed to be shared and the foundation for understanding how this works. Um, so Ishpeming 
is the word for the universe, um, the creation of Asia the universe. Um, in our creation story, um, originally, our word for God is Kishimonatu. And Kishimonatu, God, had a dream, had a vision, had a dream. And it was a dream of experience. It was a dream of everything. Everything, pain, joy, love, suffering, mountains, cars, cities, rivers. It was a dream of everything that exists. And it was seen that that dream needed to come into being. Um, so Kichumanadu um, <coughs> sent out the first creation in a song. I always laugh because I think about um, the commonality with a number of religions, but you know, in the beginning there was the word. <laughs> So the uh, shaker saw the song that was sent out, and you know creation began, but there was nothing to reflect that creation back, and of course nothing can be gained without reflection. And so she wanted to gather everything back, um, gathered the song back, and what was left was the trails of the stars and the galaxies, and then there was light. And then the creation song was sent into being again. And um, everything unfolded. <laughs> and then everything unfolded from there, and it's a very, you know, well complicated story. So, um, and then our, our brief piece of our creation of humans. Um, uh, humans, everything was created before us humans. Us humans were the last in the order of creation. Uh, we are the weakest and most dependent. Um, the, we have a, a creator, the original mother was Kijirokwe, who was a sky woman, and she birthed twins. Um, and it was the animals, it was the bear that offered to give his life initially to help the humans live. Uh, because otherwise we would have just died. Um, so there's a, a very strong feeling that, you know, the earth can live without us, the plants can live without us, the animals can live without us. We can't live without the help of everything else, so we're the least in the order of creation. Um, physically, very weak and pathetic, <laughs> and dependent. Um, but we were given the power to dream. The thing that sets humans apart from a lot of the other orders of creation was that we were given the gift of the power to dream. Well, if all of the creation is a dream, humans were given the power to create. And the man that told me this story at first said, and that's why we need our culture. Because, because we have this amazing dreaming power, we, the weakest in creation, the most pathetic piece of creation, have the ability to go way off track. Because we have so much power, we have so much dreaming power, that if we don't have our culture and our teachings, to keep us in balance, we have the power to go way off the deep end. Yeah. Dream up something like the boson party. <laughs> <laughs> so it's this beautiful, I mean, of course, and also in the creation story and a number of other stories, there's this duality that's made inherent in life. Um, that made all of the other orders of being come into existence. So as well as the amazing beauty and power of our dreaming, you know, comes destruction. And we need to be careful with it. So here's the basics of um, everything is the dream song. So we right now are everything is the song, the dream song of the creator being lived and adapting and transforming and unfolding. And that's what everything is, is the dream song. What differentiates your experience from my experience is the different patterns. So when I was taught this, I was told to hold my hand in front of my mouth. Ah, the vibration, right? Everything's songs, everything's a pattern. Everything's a pattern of vibration. This is why when I was an undergrad, I was a physics major. The physics cosmology story just matched my trans creation story so perfectly that I got all captivated. That's what got me to sign. Um, it's the different patterns of this vibration, this energy, this dream song, interacting with itself. Um, the premise that comes out of understanding and the knowledge is that things don't make the world. 
relationships make the world. It's the relationship with the dreams of the itself. That's why, and that is not just in this like visionary, you know, spiritual dream level. This is my relationship with my computer, with you, with the drop of water, with everything, every footstep. Or do I need to move this way? Stay in the frame, yeah. Oh, you could oh sorry. <laughs> so relationships make the world. That's the meaning of life is relationship and living in a harmonious relationship. Um, humans are weak and dependent, but we have this dreaming power. And um, we have teachings to help us maintain balance. Um, and this is a big one. Knowledge emerges from creation. Knowledge comes from the land. Knowledge, you know, and, and, and the, the relationships of people with the land. That's where you gain knowledge. Um, the Anishinaabe people have um, special processes for teaching young people how to learn from the land and how to learn from each other and how to learn from their dreams. Um, and I, I am quite sure that uh, many, many other tribes do. So, <clears throat> so basic indigenous principles, and a lot of these are reflected also in Frank's talk. Um, Reciprocity. Um, I have never met an uh, indigenous person or culture that does not have reciprocity as a fundamental. Your life is a gift and you give back for in return for that gift. Um, and that shows up in all, it's supposed to show up. Of course, life are never perfect, right? But these are some goals that we try to work for. Sustainability. The seven generation principle. You know, you're, you want your choices to be <coughs> gifts to your to the future. Uh, responsibility. This is not just um, this is what used to, to make me grumpy when I was working when I was a teenager um, here in Humboldt County. And I remember um, a lot of people really like to talk about um, a lot of these philosophical ideas. Um, all with their own, you know, the, the people that share those same ideas and feel very, you know, pat on the back and self-gratitude about, oh, we, we have these great ideas and thoughts and ideas for the future. But you also have responsibility. You also have responsibility. You have, you know, we have children to feed. We have rent to pay. We have a community to serve. We have people that are poor, we have people that are drug addicts, we have family members that are alcoholics, and we have a lot of healing and some hard-ass work to do. And facing that response, and we have a culture to pass on, and we have a language to revise, and we have relationships to rebuild with our land and our society, and we have to figure out how to do that interculturally, intersocioeconomically these days. So, like I said, we have a big old backpack of responsibility that you carry around with you, and that is important. <laughs> Feeling good every day is not necessarily the most important thing. Um, I, remember, I remember my grandmother saying to me when I was 16 years old, right, classic, I don't care about your stupid little self-esteem. <laughs> what good are you? <laughs> what good are you to your family and community? <laughs> so, um, also there's these principles that, that I've kind of emerged, and this is my like academia, my PhD stuff, researching culture and sustainability and traditions, and TEK, traditional ecological knowledge. Well, one of the things that people share, again, is this empathy, reciprocity, sustainability, responsibility, relationship as the key to the unseen and seen world, to your relationship to the spiritual. There's also this premise that you can't control anything. You can't predict ultimately or control anything. We are we are the we, there is no name. We always I always laugh at <laughs> nature. We are we are nature. We are the ecology. You know, um, you can't control it. You are it. You're an expression of it. 
um, you can you can try to predict certain things and you can act on things, but you can't control anything. Um, so active learning is social learning, talked about in resilient science. Um, adaptation and mirroring the other orders of being, mirroring the geologic processes, mirroring the plant world, mirroring those relationships that we see expressed as God's dream all around us. That's what it's about. A um, couple of things. Boundaries and limits. There are boundaries and limits on resources. There's boundaries and limits on human behavior. There's boundaries and limits that need to be honored and respected. That's the, that is the source of a lot of tribal guidelines for resource use. You don't harvest certain things at some time. Um, you don't go into certain areas at some times. Some things are sacred. You will disrupt the balance. You have to treat everything with respect or else that animal is going to take itself away from you and not let you hunt anymore. Those plants are going to take themselves away from you because everything is alive. Everything has consciousness. And if you act disrespectfully to that plant that gives you life, that plant that gives you life is going to take itself away. Because every, you know, and, and, and I don't talk about this all the time because some people hear about the spiritual relationships and their brain turns off and they don't want, they, they discount everything else you say. But, uh, but fundamentally it's that spiritual relationship with all of these other orders of being that matter the most in most indigenous societies. In, in that culture, how, how do you uh, relate to like the rocks and the water and the air? I mean, everything's relational. Everything's. I mean, does it, does, uh, you know, your uh, your travel background? Is, I mean, uh, they they have that you know belief that the rocks are living things and the air and water are all living things too. Yeah. Uh, there's no difference between animals and, and plants and rocks and air. It's all. Not so much. No. Um, it's kind of funny because in my language, I've been learning language and. Um, there's animate and inanimate forms of speech. Um, uh, and in some ways, when you're talking about a rock, um, and sometimes you'll speak of the rock as inanimate, and sometimes you'll speak of it as animate. It depends on what the relationship is. So there's different, um, there's different types, there's different forms of life. But, you know, fundamentally, everything is God. So and we, we create life essentially we, we create life yeah i mean what that's why we, that's why people used to think that Anishinaabe and other native peoples were were polytheistic because they would see people making offerings to the water spirits and to the four directions and to the thunders and to um special different rocks and the earth and and they would say oh they believe in lots of little gods well in, you know, I'm gonna, I only speak for myself, obviously, so I am only speaking for myself, but everything is God, but there are different patterns of that dream that have their own spiritual life and being and power, and so that's when people make offerings to the water and offerings to these different spiritual elements in, in the world. So. <coughs> So, <laughs> so designing systems for providing for your needs from the foundation of this culture. You know, that's what we're looking to do here. Um, so we, just, we want to design, and anybody who's an ecological engineer or permaculture designer or you know, works with these systems will see a lot of similarities. Here. You design based on the patterns of community, the patterns of energy flow through the environment through your home, you know, through each other. Water flow, geometry, and culture. This is deep. This requires people to relearn how to learn from creation, how to remember to see and to observe. Um, the process in ecology includes people, history, and culture. And I shared this with some with um, her. When I, I used to teach here, and I still teach you know, in different circumstances. And, and the first thing that I want to do is begin to help rebuild people's relationships. 
So I would tell people the stories of the stories in the land. So the land, the land is here. It's full of the memories, the history, the stories, and the living presence of the indigenous people that have lived here that were, were born to live in responsibility in this homeland, the we off, the you're off, the the Ufa. So I would tell people stories so that they would be able to walk through this world and they would know, oh, this is the beginning of Yurok territory. Oh, Highway 101 is an old Yurok trading route. <laughs> you know, there's, there's living relationships that are built. I would also teach people about the medicine and the edible plants because we were talking about telling stories and the importance of telling stories to becoming indigenous and learning those stories, learning those relationships. Well, gosh, the knowledge of medicine plants, the knowledge of food plants, that's a thread that reaches you, that ties you back to the people that learn that, that learn that that's the medicinal values of that plant thousands of years ago, you know, hundreds and hundreds of years ago. Um, you're, you become part of the thread through time. I mean, you walk here and you know that, you know, I'm a straight transplant to this local area, but I can respect and I can feel the history of that brought us all here. You can't ignore history to have a sustainable community at all. Um, you have to face it and address it and become it, become part of that history. So we do that. Um, I would also have people, if they were morning people, every day for a month, mark the place the sun rises on the horizon and draw a little picture of what plans, what, what you notice. Same place, every day. Go to it, visit it, mark the place of sun, as a right here in the evening first, mark the place of sunsets. Notice what plants are growing, how are they growing, what, what do you see, you know. Do that for a month. People don't do that. Maybe people here do, but my students, profound, revelationary, revelation to begin to notice and to begin to become a part of your landscape again. Rebuild those relationships between you and the, the sources of your life and your community. Yeah. I, I have a question. Um, I know that a lot of the uh, culture is based on the stories around a specific place where the um, community had lived for a long time, mm -hmm. and uh, a lot of the uh, tribes were resettled. Uh, and so my question is, um, um, are new stories being told about the new place, or is uh, the stories of the old place kept alive mm -hmm. even though uh, the, there is a this physical distance now between the tribe and the place born? I think it depends on, you know, I'm going to speak from my knowledge, which is my little bubble, right? Both. From, from my experience, both. People have this um, pressure to maintain their old stories. But one of the things that we're doing these days is we're bringing back, teaching people how to learn from creation. Mm -hmm. And when you do that, that's what you do, is you learn. Right. That's what makes you indigenous to the new place, right? It's like having new stories now about where you are. But also tying into that history. You can't miss that part. So. I live in Tucson, Arizona right now. Before I could, because of what my teachings, be, I could not be comfortable living in Tucson, Arizona without, and I don't know if this might sound weird to people, but without going out to where I live and asking permission, because we, we believe in spiritual forces that are tied to ancestors, that are tied to the patterns of that dream, you know, that places and people are inextricable. So me, an mixed Anishinaabe woman, going to Tucson, well, Tucson, is, that's the land of the Atham, that's the land of the Yaqui, that's the land of their history and their stories and their, and the, and the, the it was Mexico, the Mexican people, the, all of that is tied, it's, it's interconnected. So me, as a, as a foreigner coming there, I couldn't really feel comfortable without kind of spiritually presenting myself and making a little offering in the best way I know how and introducing myself to the landscape and the people there and, and um, acknowledging myself as somebody that has a lot to learn and then learning about 
you know, now my sons, we gather in the ski beans and we eat a lot of cactus and we are learning the local stories and traditions and history so that we can be respectful visitors and live there in a good way. So I wouldn't come there. I, I come there learning from the land and w watching the patterns of energy move, and watching the patterns of water, and becoming indigenous in that way. But if you don't have the history and the culture, and the, that relationship is very, very profound. So it almost seemed that the, the tribes that had moved uh, retained the old uh, songs and stories uh, to allow the people that moved in their original territory to do that in a, in a way that is correct, right? In a good way. So to a certain extent, those stories don't need to be yeah. kept alive for that the original. Yeah. 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 Good. <laughs> within, within local place names and stories are, are written that knowledge, the relationships, um, purposes, and energy flows in the landscape. And I think that that's something really profound to think about and want to uplift. Um, like Frank said, um, what supports life is pretty much bioregional. There were amazing trade networks historically. There were trade networks running from Alaska to, to Chile um, historically that a lot of them got cut off. And actually, I have friends that are working to reestablish an indigenous trade network up and across the nation's state borders, which is kind of fun. Um, I love that work, but it's not my work, but I want to support them. <laughs> um, so, you know, trade networks, but, you know, pretty much locally there, you know. Um, limitations on market forces. So from, um, not everything can be commodified. Right now, um, I just want to, do I have time to share a little bit? Okay. Um, I was invited to be an uh, indigenous representative at a new green economy meeting at the, at the Rockefeller Estate in New York. It was very interesting. And there were people globally that were there. There were 25 of us. And people gathered to talk about how the, the new green economy, um, people are trying to package the green economy as, um, well, if you put a price tag, if you commodify, you know, we know about the carbon markets, right? They've been going on for a while, but now we, you know, and we know about the privatization, the commodification of water, which is also a very, very scary thing. Um, but they are trying to commodify, they are in the active process of commodifying biodiversity, indigenous knowledge of how to live within landscapes water, air, they are commodifying everything and labeling that the new green economy. Um, there was a meeting down in Rio recently um, where basically heads of state from all over the place were getting together to decide the rules of this game. Um, so I think we should be very conscious of that. Um, it's, uh, so would that be like uh, a carbon storage in trees where uh, governments are paid to maintain the biodiversity or the indigenous wisdom? Is, is <laughs> governments are paid to maintain indigenous wisdom, but indigenous people are being told, you know, uh, you can just be yourselves. We will pay you to just be yourselves and to continue maintaining because hot spots of biodiversity also happen to be hot spots of cultural diversity where indigenous peoples have, and local peoples, whether they call themselves indigenous or not, have been have maintained their traditions. Those ten those are the places that still have biodiversity because of Frank, you know, what Frank was talking about, how people work with the landscape and are part of the landscape and thus maintain the diversity. Um, people are basically saying, you know, be, they are being paid, they're being given money. Um, why is this important for indigenous communities? Because people have had their traditional resources stolen. <laughs> That's why indigenous peoples all over the world are, are poor and need money is because their resources have been stolen. So, you know, we'll give you money to just be yourselves, to live in your forest, to, you know, it takes away their sovereignty, it takes away their land tenure, it takes away their ability to live as adaptive natural people. 
And um, tribes that know this have been resisting, um, it, it's under the package of RED, reducing emissions through deforestation and degradation. There, there, are native, there is a native man in Honduras who was beaten and tortured and intimidated because he refused to sign on to a red agreement. So it's the same forces, you know. So we have to be really, really clear. I know it's very scary to be anti-capitalist system, but we have to be very, very clear that you cannot commodify everything. You have to limit the power of the market. So I'm a little confused there because I mean, on the surface, it would it would sound like paying indigenous people to maintain their lifestyle, or you know, creating an incentive for them to like not sell out to the cattle ranchers or whatever, uh, to you know, burn the forest and, and turn to grazing or something. That sounds like it would be a good thing. So that's what's tricky. That's what's tricky. It sounds so great. It sounds so great. Yet, it well, for one, it's it's it's. It's kind of ridiculous because the people, the people that the people that pay for that, um, what that's doing is it's allowing a coal company up here to continue. Right. Okay. Yeah. So, so it's that's kind of like buying carbon credits where. You're oh, they're indigenous knowledge credits. Is that what you're talking about? Yeah, <laughs> they're they're working on it. It's carbon taxes you're talking about. And you're talking about the Rockefeller family. Yeah. That, you're talking about the New World Order then. Well, you know, it was a weird little irony that we were there at the Rockefeller Estate talking about these things because the group of people that was there was working to organize against the, the uh, offshore banking cartel, or it's we happened to be hosted at the Rockefeller Estate. It was the um, people associated with descendants that don't agree with what's going on that brought us together, and they happened to bring us together at that location, and we were all kind of laughing with the irony. Um, but, uh, but being very clear that, you know, commodifying is not the answer, and limitation on the ultimate power of the market. Yes. We shouldn't be afraid to talk about that um, in a very educated and very real way. Um, and, you know, are you familiar with the uh, rights-based organizing of the Community Environmental Legal Defense Fund? Because that has been, uh, uh, you know, fairly successful. And you guys have actually sovereignty, so you can you have more muscle than some of the municipalities that can be overwritten by the state or the federal government. So uh, that's what we've been we've been talking a lot about that. As you know, I mean, every every community has its challenges and its struggles. Um, when, the reason why we named our organization Sustainable Nations is, you know, yeah, we have, you know, we have a lot of shit to work through and to deal with. But ultimately, I believe that our political, our political structure, the human rights mechanisms that now indigenous nations globally, within the United States as well as globally, uh, have been advancing through the United Nations and through the organization American States. Like we, we have potential from the foundation of our tradition to develop sustainable nations um, in a pretty profound way if we can do it. Um, and I think sovereignty and land tenure is a big part of that. Holding on to that, you mean? Yeah. So just because, that's, that's what gets me mad, is sometimes like when a tribe a tribal government does a, makes a stupid decision, uh, which all governments make stupid decisions, and tribal governments are, are modeled. They, tribal governments today, without giving you the whole Indian history lecture, are imposed forms of government that were imposed on Indian tribes back in 1934. Um, and so for a long time, the people that were operating within those governments were like hand-selected by the U.S. <laughs> so, you know, these days, also along with all these other things, is this movement to research traditional forms of governance. My tribe is doing. My tribe is actually uh, different. Different uh, bands of my tribe have reinstituted our clan system as forms of government and are working. You know, it's a process. We work these things out. But that's what um, gets me is when a tribal government makes a stupid decision or an ecologically inappropriate decision um, or whatever then people instantly want to attack their sovereignty. <coughs> Excuse me, they want to attack their their right to do that, mm -hmm. their political presence and their nationhood. 
to attack the bad decision. Bad choice, bad choice. Because ultimately, it will be indigenous people's political power, land tenure, political independence, people are working really hard, what people are perhaps are working really hard to do today is to get themselves liberated from dependence on the US. That's what people are working towards. And we need that independence, and we need that land tenure, and we need those rights to be able to gradually get our traditional values, gradually get our principles, our practices strong to create sustainable nations. We need that political power. And Native people, I mean, in local local communities, I mean, this doesn't even have, this doesn't have to be indigenous tribe. This can be, a, this principle can be applied to a viral it can still, community. It can still be the U.S. It can, yeah, it can function in a lot of different ways. And when people are working within a bioregion to become energy, if not self-sufficient, to move towards that, to produce our own food, to reach out to that dude who's politically opposite of you, to build relationship for the future on that scale, you know, that's community sovereignty, <laughs> which is a foundation of sustainability as well. So these things, you know, again, my world is, you know, this tribally focused political world, but it doesn't, these principles apply all over the place. Yes? I'm just curious where you think gender fits into this, because I think most of the exploitive cultures have been tended to be male-dominated, patriarchal, and that they have extended that to everything around them, including their partners that are, that are as intelligent as they are, but they have had dominion and so on power over their female counterparts for a long time too. And so, where is that part of the female part of this equation that will lend itself to stewardship rather than dominion and license and control and pillage? I don't talk too much about, about that personally, but I can say that within my within my own tribe, women's responsibility is over the land and the water. Men's responsibility is over the fire and hunting. Um, there has been a push to have women's decision making and voices be uplifted. Um, in these times because of the danger to land and water. Mm -hmm. So women as, as keepers of those things have been intentionally kind of uplifted, like you women need to step up and have your voices heard and your prayers for the water and your work with the land um, uplifted in these times because the land and the water are so in danger in a lot of different places. Um, there is a real principle of balance between the genders um, within many traditional cultures. Um, and I do think and that, that we're degraded through the boarding schools, that we're degraded through a lot of, you know, we, we do have high rates of domestic violence. We do have, you know, a, a lot of these things, but, um, but re-empowering our traditions on all levels, our governance, our relationship with the land, and our relationship with each other. You know, I think balance is, is, is the key, because also as the mother of sons, uh, one of the reasons why I don't do, um, do the woman talk a lot is because in California, we have a lot of people doing, you know, um, and for a good reason, so I don't want to degrade that either, doing the women, 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 but I'm the mother of sons, you know. I know I'm strong as a woman and I don't have a man's energy. I don't have whatever that fire is that's, that is a man's something that needs to be uplifted and honored as a man, as a good man, as a protector, as a provider, as, as whatever that man is, you know. And so, I think balance. So I talk a lot about balance. Um, <laughs> I thought that. You know, I just see my own head. So, where do we go here with all of this? I mean, you could tell that this could be a lot of different presentations, but uh, rebuilding relationship is key with your community, with our communities, with each other, <laughs> with our ecology.
um, indigenous technologies. Um, there are indigenous technologies and practices that our grandparents were told were primitive and backwards that need to be uplifted and revived and moved into contemporary times. Um, we need to learn contemporary techniques and technologies that express these core values. And ultimately, what you believe about yourself and your role in society, your culture, um, does express what you do in the world. So identifying that um, and working with that. And, and as we all know, man, all of these beautiful visions and values and things that we share, that we see for the future of the world, they're going to, uh, they will only come from dramatic restructuring of our, of the, this hegemonic society and this system, this economic system we're in, and the physical infrastructure that has been developed and built on this culture of separation and control and infinite resource use. <laughs> <laughs> so with that vision in mind of restructuring, but surely that's how we move that's how I we move forward and this is the most you know the art about our relationship and really it's just all completely connected um, this is our information our organization's information and thank you very much for sharing and listening Wow, Elise, that was outstanding. Thank you very much.